It's the end of the game, the last great oil reserve. Alberta's tar sands are a resource worth billions, but are we giving it away? I keep reading in the American media that their whole energy problem is going to be solved by the Alberta Canadian oil sands, and that's not a good thing for our country. Washington sees Canada sitting on the solution to America's energy needs. But are we savaging the landscape to satisfy foreign hunger for oil? This is just about the dirtiest way that you could make oil that, that we have invented. I'm Anne-Marie MacDonald. DocZone looks at the selling of Alberta. And here we have a serious problem. America is addicted to oil. This is the last great source of oil on the planet. Global warming, toxic sludge on a scale that's unprecedented anywhere in the world. Each barrel that is produced here in North America among friends is one less barrel from the Middle East. Desperate to wean itself off Middle East oil, the West wagers its future on the Alberta tar sands. The stakes are global, the battle intense, the outcome uncertain. It comes down to one simple idea. Whoever controls the tar sands controls the world. The only thing I can assure you won't happen is what everybody thinks will. Canada used to be a bit player in the global oil market with a reserve of five billion barrels of conventional crude. But deep in the backwoods of Alberta is a buried treasure. Trapped under an area the size of Florida, 174 billion barrels of oil up for grabs. What looks like dense topsoil is actually black gold. Enough unconventional oil to last a hundred years. Once dismissed as dirty and expensive, the tar sands are now seen as an energy El Dorado. With the U.S. craving energy security and new super consumers like China and India starving for oil, Canada's unconventional crude has now become conventional. Alberta oil sands are a major, major player in the world energy scene. Uh, that, uh, that awareness has come recently. We forecasted it many years ago, but it's now very real. With development quadrupling over the next decade, the world wants in, and Alberta is open for business. But are they driving a hard bargain? or selling Canadian sovereignty at liquidation prices. You can't build the world's largest energy project or the world's largest capital project, for that matter, and not change the nation. Canada now has this image as some kind of emerging energy superpower. And so more and more, the politics of the country have to deal with oil and money from oil. and the environmental problems that come, in particular, from dirty oil. And the tar sands has implications for every aspect of life. The rise of Canada as an energy superpower is tied to the collapse of America's sense of invincibility. The American dream had been fueled by a steady supply of cheap, available oil. But on September 11, 2001, everything changed. Oil supply and pricing had been stable for 20 years. Now the only thing certain is uncertainty. Middle East oil is tainted by terrorism and oil goes from a simple commodity to the key component of Western security. After terrorism and a nuclear or biological weapon, energy security is the number three threat, I think, after that for our security in the United States and, for that matter, Canada. Locking down a secure supply of oil becomes an American obsession. But increasingly, oil is a closed market, with 90% of conventional reserves controlled by nationally owned companies. 
These companies, as in Venezuela and Russia, often have their own geopolitical agendas. A large majority of those uh, reserves that are nationally owned are, are in countries that are somewhat unstable, sometimes real unstable, uh, and potentially unfriendly to the West and the United States particularly. America, desperate for a carbon fix, follows anyone who promises a steady supply. A U.S.-Canadian dual citizen, Paul Michael Wiebe, wants to be the dealer, hooking American buyers on Canadian product. We are in a world of transition after 9-11, and we are in a world of transition in the global oil market. And I believe Canada has a leading role to play. Since the Iraq war began in 2003, the price of oil has spiked 400%. The overheated market gives Weeby a platform to preach the virtues of tar sands oil. Oil sands have been the stepchild of the global oil market for decades and decades. They've been marginalized, bastardized, if you will. In fact, unconventional oils are emerging as a dominant force in the petroleum market. At the oldest privately owned bank in America, Weeby assures investors that tar sands crude, although nearly 10 times more expensive to extract than Middle East oil, is a bargain. That security of supply as a consequence of 9-11 trumps cost of supply. And that is a fundamental shift. Three weeks after its invasion of Iraq, the U.S. government decrees the tar sands should be counted as part of Canada's conventional energy supply, propelling it from 21st to second on the list of national oil reserves. Alberta now, from a standing start, effectively, it's approaching the production level of Kuwait. By 2045, the volume coming out of the oil sands in Alberta alone will approach 11 million barrels a day. That's a stunning figure. It's an overwhelming figure. And that will continue for a century. If Alberta caters exclusively to America, it can satisfy their daily appetite for 9 million barrels of imported oil for the next 100 years. The twilight of Middle East oil could become the dawn of a new golden age fueled by the tar sands. But at what cost? Well, good morning, Fort McMurray. It's Diana Lincoln here with you. 7.30 and 3 degrees downtown. Traffic is already starting to back up, heading out to site. So please be patient if you're heading out there. And if you got a traffic tip, give me a call, 791-CJOK. At the epicenter of Alberta's oil explosion is Fort McMurray, a rough-and-ready boomtown that grinds to its own internal rhythm. Three shifts a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, a steady steamroll of 30,000 workers. Fort McMurray has got the feel of, of Hong Kong about it. I mean, everyone is working all the time, 24-7. And everyone's got some kind of dream. And, and their dream, funny enough, none, none of their dreams uh, end in Fort McMurray. McMurray attracts fortune seekers from around the globe, especially from Newfoundland. They may have come by chance, but they stay by necessity, making McMurray Newfoundland's third largest city, with 25,000 islanders settling I want here. Moving from the rock to the sands makes one occasionally crave a taste of home. At cozy corners, one can get true comfort food. Newfie hash served by a waitress with a familiar accent. How you doing, bud? Food for the arteries this morning. Tired of waiting for work, Jeff Wiscombe left St. John's eight years ago, coming to the place Islanders call Fort McMoney. Do you like it, James? He and his wife Gail expected to get rich quick, then return home. 
try it. But with the birth of James, their roots here have deepened. Well, half the time for Christmas, usually every second year we go home. But now we got him, we'll probably spend more time here, like in his house, in his Christmas tree. The big thing with the Newfoundlanders, especially, that they just they're drawn to where they grew up. I don't know what it is. It's a certain magic about the place, I guess. I don't know. Well, we'll get home eventually. We'd like to get home before he goes to school. Our goal is in four years, we're hoping. We started we're out hoping. with a three-month plan. We came here for three months. So. Only another 35 years. <laughs> and we're here eight years now. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. tell them. The migrant worker's dream that Newfoundland's own oil mega project will one day get up and running, allowing them to finally return home. In the middle of the North Sea, other international oil players are plotting their own assault on Canada's tar sands. Stig Berkset is senior vice president with Norway's Statoil, Scandinavia's largest company. Statoil has managed to make money without compromising its social or environmental values. It's flush with cash from its North Sea reserves, but those reserves are finally declining. You say declining, yes. I may argue that a little bit and say our ambition is to maintain the level that we currently are at. So we need to look abroad. Traveling up the Christina River near Fort McMurray, Stig has over $2 billion to buy some pay dirt. He's just learned his company's oil fields in Venezuela have been expropriated by President Chavez and Stig's desperate to secure a new foreign beachhead. Canada offers an attractive and stable regime very different from uh, most other places around the world where you can find oil and gas. Looming over the riverbank is a rich outcrop of oil-soaked land. It's part of an 1,100 square kilometer lease held for the last six years by Calgary-based North American Oil Sands Corporation. Like many Canadian companies, they lack the billions needed to exploit the site, money that Stig has in abundance. My goodness, look at this. Canada's loss is Norway's gain. I'd just like to welcome you. Okay. Stig is here to inspect the land with a team of geologists, substantiating claims before buying in. And you notice, of course, you're standing on oil sands. Everywhere you look is oil sand. It looks a little gray here, of course, because it weathers. But if you crack it open, you'll see this is oil sand. And of course, it's just sand that's saturated with bitumen. This nugget of black gold is part of more than two billion barrels of recoverable oil that the Calgary leaseholder claims are trapped in the land. What you're looking at here, I mean, this is a natural pavement, huh? and it's slowly melting. And in fact, you can see that this, is, this could even be considered a liquid. You can see the, the flow, and you can put your imprint in it. On a very hot day, this becomes very, very soft. And once you dig it up, you can see how rich that is. That's about as rich oil sand as, as comes about naturally. Mm. The size of the resource is enormous. And the day you can commercialize that resource, Canada will be sort of the second largest resource country in the world. To become second only to Saudi Arabia, Canada seems content to allow companies like Statoil lead the way. If foreigners drive tar sands development, are Canadians just along for the ride? I think it is a critical question, are we, do we have any sovereignty at all in terms of our, our energy sector? Because it is majority foreign owned and interestingly a lot of the companies involved now and increasingly so are national oil companies or pu publicly owned oil companies from nations that have chosen to maintain that sovereignty over their own resources which is very ironic that Alberta and Canada haven't got that kind of public ownership in Alberta's oil sands at all. There's a big difference between being an energy colony and an energy superpower. Everyone wants a piece of the tar sands, yet Alberta continues to charge one of the lowest oil royalty rates in the world. Albertans are trying to say, well, we just want to give this energy to you guys and sell it as quick as we can, and, and we're kind of in liquidation mode. And that's where we have not been very smart. 
And what the tar sands tell us every day, which we seem to neglect and forget every day, is that this is the end of the game. This is the last great source of oil on the planet. And you know what, guys? It's really dirty. It's really expensive. It comes with a huge environmental footprint. It takes approximately the energy equivalent of one barrel of oil to produce two barrels of oil in Fort McMurray.